Hey, welcome to the latest edition of Hump Day Hangout. It is the first Wednesday of the month. That means we're talking training with the folks from Penwell Fire Engineering and the International Society of Fire Service Instructors. Before we kick off this session, uh, we do want to put our thoughts and prayers out to all the brothers and sisters, law enforcement, fire and EMS in Las Vegas. Um, several people that we know are on the ground there, both as responders, but also uh, were attending the concert or visiting in the Las Vegas area when the events occurred this week. Uh, one of the largest, if not, I guess it is the largest uh, mass shooting to occur in the United States. And uh, we just want to make sure that everybody's keeping them in our thoughts and prayers at this time. And as we go through with what we're doing every day, uh, keep them in mind and and hopefully we'll learn from those events uh, for future ones. Um, this month, we're going to talk a little bit about commercial firefighting and how training relates to that. But before we do that, we do have a few announcements. As always, you can follow us on Twitter, or if you have a question, uh, you can send those through Twitter at hashtag FE talk. And we'll be monitoring that throughout the show. If you have a question, uh, please post it on there, like and share uh, our posts on Twitter at hashtag FE talk. Uh, the Society and Penwell Fire Engineering every year give out a Instructor of the Year Award. The uh, George D. Post Instructor of the Year Award It is given every year at FDIC, and nominations for that award are now open. Uh, so it'll be published in Fire Engineering Magazine. You can also find it at the isfsi.org website, as well as Fire Engineering's website. You can download the nomination, fill it out. Only needs to be about a page. Um, but we all know there's a tremendous amount of instructors doing great things out there, and uh, we want to recognize those people. So please uh, reach out to us and nominate somebody for the 2018 George D. Post Instructor of the Year Award. Um, Fire Rescue Magazine, which is one of the uh, publications done by Penwell, is uh, been gracious enough to give the Instructor Society a monthly column. So we will be starting a instructor's column uh, in Fire Rescue Magazine, and it not only will be written by uh, members of the board of directors like myself from ISFSI, but we want some content. We want to give our members and people that are engaged with us the opportunity to be published. does not have to be a, a great long expose. We're looking for articles in the 900 to 1500 words, maybe a couple of pictures, could be about a training prop, could be about a new curriculum, could be a, a tip or a tool. Uh, something about instructor, instructor development, um, anything that you think is unique, uh, useful, that could be spread out to the National Fire Service related to training and instructional de development, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, those are going to start going into Fire Rescue Magazine very soon. Um, again, Bobby Halton is with us, and we'd like to turn the camera to him for a second to uh, give us some many uh, words of advice, and then I'll kick it back to our co-host, Aaron Heller, for our topic this month. So, Bobby? Hi, uh, thanks so much, Steve, and, and uh, everybody, thank you for joining us today. Hey, uh, you know, not to beat, beat it up, but um, clearly all our sentiments are with everybody in Vegas, uh, all our fellow brothers and sisters in the fire department, the police department, the EMS folks, the docs, the nurses, heck, the whole community. Everybody who was there, country western music fans, um, the musicians, I understand, our good buddy Eddie Buchanan uh, had played at the festival. Uh, Eddie's a world-class drummer, for those of you who don't know, probably one of the premier drummers in the uh, music industry today. Uh, he was a performer there. Uh, my son Dean was in the audience with his girlfriend and a group of friends uh, when the shooting occurred. Um, it's a fascinating uh, thing to think about and, and be prepared for. We live in a free society, the freest society in history. Um, and we have uh, incredible responsibility when it comes to that. Uh, clearly, there are always going to be madmen who are going to try to disrupt our freedom and limit our freedom and get people to uh, try to limit our freedom through all kinds of crazy ways um, and, and intimidating us and, and making us fearful. But people like that will never succeed because that's not who America is. And the American law enforcement and fire service and EMS people proved that Sunday night. Uh, my son was there to witness that bravery and heroism. Uh, he and other military veterans like him uh, stood up and took charge and helped people get to safety and help people get treatment. That's just because that's who we are. And to deny the greatness of America, the uniqueness of America, 
and our ability to overcome any obstacle and any uh, impediment to our freedom is ill thought out. Uh, we will defeat this nonsense. Uh, responsible gun ownership is a privilege which Americans hold dear in the Second Amendment and, and will continue to be held dear as a piece of our founding freedoms. Uh, and that's emphasis on responsible gun ownership. So we understand the issues in the fire service better than any. We're the people who go to gunshot victims. Uh, we're the folks who respond to these tragedies and get to deal with them up close and personal. On that note, to all our brothers and sisters who responded, make sure you, uh, you know, talk about it. Make sure you get clear on it. Make sure you reach out. Um, that's what it's all about. We are a family. And the way to stay strong as you go through these tragedies is to take care of one another. Talk about it. Hash it out. Deal with it now. Uh, you know, it's, it's okay to be freaked out by something like this. I don't care who you are. This is radically unexpected. Uh, dynamically disruptive to our normal assumptions about the world. People don't do crazy stuff like this, or they shouldn't do crazy stuff like this. So please get help if you need it. Um, you know, and, and we mean that. And, and remember the Florian Society is out there to help you. Uh, there's all kinds of great peer support stuff, um, all kinds of good stuff. If you're, if you're having pro problems dealing with it, reach out and we'll help you get connected. So, um, it just, just, that's how it is. So anyway, today we have some really great stuff to talk about. And before we get into that, my friends, uh, remember FDIC is coming up. Please register early. Uh, if you don't register early and get a room, I can't help you. <laughs> it will sell out. Rooms will go away. Uh, it's a tough show to get a seat downtown at. So please, please, please register early. You can register now. Steve Peterman will be teaching there. Aaron will be teaching there. Heck, everybody on this show today will be teaching there and, and participating in the conference. So uh, please uh, get yourself there. We'd love to see you there. Uh, let us know how we can help you. Let me know what we can do better. So registration's open and up, so please do that. As Steve said, Fire Rescue is adding some incredible columnists, uh, the likes of which you've never seen before. Everybody from Dennis Rubin, Mike Dugan, Ray McCormick, Stevie Pegram, Angie Hughes, uh, uh, Nick Martin, uh, the, the, the whole training traditions group, the, the, the list is amazing. Please, please, please take a look at, at what's going on there. What an amazing, amazing group of people who've come forward to uh, uh, participate in, in putting out um, arguably the perfect sister companion of fire engineering. Uh, you know, just uh, an amazing uh, compliment there. So thank you, Steve, for that shout out. We sure do appreciate it. Uh, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to the man of the hour, Mr. Commercial Fires himself, Aaron Heller. I don't know about I don't know about Mr. Commercial Fires, but uh, we've certainly been studying it and training on it a lot, and uh, that was the reasoning for this this topic uh, uh, for today's hangout. Um, one of the things that we found throughout the years, uh, just in my department and departments around us, and and then other places that we went to train was that um, a lot of departments really didn't understand the complexity of, of commercial firefighting or even the simplicity of commercial firefighting. Uh, they, they, a lot of places are to this day still using residential tactics, still using you know, a kind of a flawed thought process that's just not really learning from the history of what we've had. And uh, so the idea behind it was, let's talk a little bit more about training our firefighters to respond to these types of calls because what I'm seeing is I travel around the country and, and um, even I was just in Indy recently uh, and the outskirts of Indy, I, I was out in Greenwood area and then we drove down, we were headed further south toward Louisville and just seeing all the new commercial uh, construction that's going on. Um, you know, whatever the reason for that may be, uh, if the economy is coming back and this, these commercials are building out into the country, Somebody's got to protect that. And guys who were used to just doing one and two family dwellings and maybe a barn fire here or there need to wake up because this is coming to your neighborhood and, and you've got to train your people for it. Um, not to mention, those are huge rateables. So you, you really want to protect them because the mayor is going to want that protected. So uh, that's that's the thought process behind it. And I know having, having Nick with us, who's done tons of training on this, and uh, I invited Rusty Ricker. Rusty is uh, – 
the president of the New England Pools and uh, the deputy chief in Georgetown, Massachusetts, because I know that uh, the New England Pools have been up there pushing this type of training for quite some time. And I, if I'm not mistaken, just did some last weekend. So um, that's that's the impetus behind today. And uh, I'm looking forward to lots of input with it. Uh, Steve? Well, I think um, real quick, when we have Rusty uh, introduce himself and then Nick, just so they know a little bit about your background specific to today's topic as well. Rusty, you there? I guess I'll go first. Yeah, I was going to let Nick go. <clears throat> um, my name is Rusty Ricker. I'm a uh, 28, almost, yeah, 27, 28 year veteran of the fire service, president of the Little Fools, um, been a career fireman as well as a call fireman. And, uh, the areas north of Boston, basically the, the suburbs, if you will. Very good. Nicholas? Hey, uh, Nick Martin. I'm a uh, battalion chief in the city of Columbia in, in South Carolina. I started out outside of Philadelphia, very close to, uh, well, actually right there with Steve, and, uh, you know, spent some time in the Washington, D.C. fire department, and uh, I guess a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> So, so going to our topic, uh, all three of you, I'll let one of you chime in when you're ready. Um, obviously, I happen to be in a community currently. I've worked in places that are, are very urban. I've worked in places that are very rural. And the place I currently work is very suburban with a little bit of rural. Um, so we don't get a high frequency of fires in anything but a residential one or two family dwelling. Um, but we have focused recently on some training and um, making sure our guys understand uh, what line to pull and they're not pulling the 150 foot inch and three quarter on the commercial building or the apartment building maybe even or something like that. But we've also messed around with longer stretches, uh, 300 foot and 400 foot pre-connects, which at one time uh, sounded very taboo to a lot of people. And even when we posted a video a few weeks ago of us stretching a 400 foot line, a bunch of people commented, why would you do that? And the, the quick answer is because if the fire's 400 feet away, we have to be able to get to it. Um, but you know, these buildings are getting bigger and bigger and, and they're going in all over the place. I know in our neck of the woods, we're seeing a lot of three and four story, all wood truss, uh, commercial on the first floor, apartments on the second, third and fourth. And I know Aaron just mentioned, you know, the Indianapolis area, they've already had a fire in a very similar building, it didn't go well. Um, no, no fault of the fire department, but it's basically a big lumber yard full of materials, full of people, full of combustibles. And, and I believe in their case, they had a very windy day and the results didn't turn out good. So I'm gonna kick it back to Aaron a little bit because I know Aaron has focused a lot of his professional career and teaching around the country, both at FDIC and on the road. Uh, talking about commercial buildings and big box stores and things like that. And, uh, you know, some of those challenges, but also relating it back to the training officer, or the company officer, the person that's responsible for training an organization, what should they be looking at? What should they be doing? And I know also Nick's got some ideas with what they're doing in Columbia on how to integrate the commercial building into your training plan. So Aaron, back to you. Well, oh, great. Uh, well, and that's exactly it is, Okay, so it's easy to say, hey, guys, we, we got to train on this stuff because your one and two family dwelling tactics are going to get you jammed up. You can look at, you know, all the way back, you can look at Hackensack, you can look at Charleston, you can look at all these different places. Um, so it's not like this is anything new. Um, but lots of guys are seeing everything going on with the one and two family, with all the studies, all the research. They've got to understand that this isn't going to be the same. So what I think first things first is they have to understand tactically what we do at these fires. It's not the basic inch and three quarter fire. It's not the, the residential search tactics, you know, at the Walmart type fire. So once they put it into perspective, they've got to decide what they're going to do as a department or as a region, even, you know, what are your SOPs going to be on this? And, and I had this conversation the other day with a fellow out West and he, and he said to me, he said, we don't have SOPs. We just pull up and we wing it. And I said, do you do that on house fires? He said, no, we have a set SOP. So then it's time to get yourself. And, and I'm not one. If you looked at my, my, probably my discipline file, you would see that I am definitely not one for hard and fast rules, but you need at least a guideline. 
and then we can train to the guideline. You know, is it always that we stretch a two and a half on every commercial like a lot of departments do? Or is it that, you know, we add heavier, heavier stuff to our box. So instead of getting two engines in a truck on, on an alarm of fire at the Walmart, we do three and two or whatever the case may be. But we need to train to what those guidelines are going to be. And then we need to set up what our training is actually going to be, what props we want, and we can go from there. So I think that's the first thing, the first step of it. And understanding what's in your district, you know, just getting out and pre-planning and seeing what's there. I know Nick and those guys with traditions do a lot of stuff on what's what throwing up a lot of good pictures online of this is in your district. What are you doing with it? So I'll, I'll throw it over to Nick because I know he can definitely speak to that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, definitely a good topic. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I work in, in Columbia, South Carolina, and we we do run a fair number of commercial fires. Um, and we're not all that far, obviously, from Charleston, which learned uh, um, some very tough lessons at, at their infamous fire. Um, you know, and I, I think, you know, some of the opportunities or some of the things that, that we've been doing with that is um, – we have a, uh, a critique process or an after action review process that I'm very proud of and I think brings a lot um, to the table and basically make a long story short, uh, after any fire of significance, um, we usually have a formal critique with all the first alarm companies at minimum. We do it you know, at the first two companies firehouse. You know, the, I'm the, the training chief, our, our training bureau will put together a, uh, a presentation um, where we kind of we've kind of nailed down a format of stuff that's included in every presentation and we'll go through the different categories, you know, what did we do for fire attack? You know, what did we do for ventilation? What did we do for searches if applicable? That, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, and, and most importantly, it's what could, what could we do better? And I tell the guys when we have those, you know, this, this, this discussion is 10% about the fire we had the other day and 90% about the next fire we have that's similar to it. You know, what's already happened has already happened, you know, but we're going to run a similar fire again. And what what can we learn out of that? And um, I, I've even found I mean, I like to think I know what I'm talking about. But, you know, I found that, like, when we do that stuff. It really makes me think about stuff. Um, you know, for example, I had you talk about policies and stuff. I had a hand in writing um, our, our, resi our, our structure fire policies, which, you know, are, are fairly oriented towards a residential structure. And just just one example you know, our default mode of operation for a ladder company here is split, you know, an inside team and an outside team. And the more I've been going to and operating at and learning from commercial fires, um, I start to see that perhaps there's probably more of an argument for having a, an all, you know, the first in engine, first in ladders, all, all in meaning, meaning all members are going inside or all out because, you know, go into the roof because if a flat roof convert, you know, ventilating a flat roof commercial is not a two man operation. It's a four man operation. And we, uh, you know, we, we make our people in a commercial building, you're either on a hose line or you're on a search rope and a search rope is not a two man operation either. So, um, you know, the, I think that there's a lot to be said from learning from the incidents that you go to and learning from the incidents that other people go to. Uh, and, and one other thing, you know, Chief Pegram mentioned is uh, we have an acquired buildings program here that, that I'm very proud of and has been very successful. We we're in a county in a city that provides us with quite a bit of acquired buildings. Um, at any given time, we've got a few houses. We just finished up with a hotel complex last week. And I've got, a, you know, 180 acres of old commercial buildings down, down the street that they're redoing that and they're all commercial. Um, that we have various opportunities in. So we try to integrate that a lot into our field training um, in getting the guys into the structure, getting them comfortable with the big lines, getting them comfortable with the ropes, you know, getting them on these on these roofs and seeing that cutting this roof is not like cutting a single family. I, if I was a better prepared person, which I'm often not, I would have the times in front of me. But, but one of my captains has done so much freaking acquired building um, training. He can tell you what the average time is to ventilate a peak roof single family and what the average time is to ventilate a flat roof. Um, and it's different. I know that much. It's, you know, the flat roof is about four to six minutes. And that's if we have four dedicated people up there, um, you know, assuming all the right equipment is up there easy. So it's, 
you know, I, I think that those highlighting those differences and, and getting hands on that stuff before you run the call is, is monumental in getting the success. I got a question for uh, Rusty and Aaron and, and Nick. Um, so one of the things that you, you all brought up and I think makes a lot of sense is the comparisons and differences, if you will, between single family residential and commercial, right? But I think one of the things that happens to us on the mindset, especially on these standalone commercials, the smaller standalones, whether it's your fast food restaurants, your mom and pop shops, is that because they're that standalone entity, we tend to take that residential mindset into the event, right? We don't force the rear doors. We don't do a better ventilation profile. We don't look at the, you know, obviously Nick was just talking about a residential roof is oftentimes dramatically different than a commercial roof, whether it's a strip mall or a standalone commercial, you could be talking about corrugated steel, you could be talking about, you know, built up tar and gravel, all kinds of problems that can really slow down that, that vertical vent operation and make that much more perilous, um, <clears throat> for example. So my question to you all is, so how can we, or, or what do you do, or what do you recommend to help firefighters that are responding to, and, and I think if we compartmentalize it a little bit, to say standalone commercial jobs, right? Not not the larger commercial jobs that you know set off bells and whistles immediately because they're just their their size and and complexity. But if we just take those standalone commercials, how, how do you how do we train for? How do we you know put systems in there? Because one of the things that I always get upset about is we always talk about behavior modification for the firefighter, right? But then we never mess with the system, right? And, and it's hard to outperform the system. And, and it's always easy to default to the firefighter should have done this, the firefighter should have done that. But it's a much more complicated discussion to talk about what can the system do that's going to make it safer, more effective, more efficient for the, for the, for the crews and the troops. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. How can we, how can we make the system more responsive to the needs of the users and not beat up so much the firefighters who are responding to these really complex, dynamic building fires, commercial building fires, and I'll shut up. Well, Bobby, from a chief standpoint, I think one of the problems that we have, and as I've traveled and even in the system I currently work in, um, we're not sending a different response. So if you're not front loading the incident correctly or different, differentiating between the types of incidents, um, you know, if, if a single wide mobile home and the Walmart both get the same building fire response, uh, and I don't know what that response is in every community, but I'm guessing if it's the same, it's probably inadequate for the Walmart fire um, because it's probably based around a single family dwelling mentality. Um, we were that way uh, for, for many years, and um, we currently don't have a system in place to differentiate between a residential fire and a commercial fire in our CAD system, um, but we can by address. Um, it's more work on the, the backside, but what we did is we identified our target hazards and where our commercial properties, apartment buildings, schools uh, are, and we basically by address put them all into a separate zone, and that gets a different response. So whereas the residential fire may get three engines and a quint, the commercial fire or the fire reported in this other zone uh, is heavily loaded with engines, quints, towers, uh, you know, rescue squad, whatever. Um, so I think that's part of the equation. Just starting off is what are we sending? Because if we send everybody to a structure fire and the, the outhouse and the commercial mega whatever are the same response, um, firefighters are going to do what firefighters do to try to tackle the incident, regardless of whether or not they have the right resources. And I think that's where we get into a little bit of trouble. Um, but I'll let the other guys talk a little more about, you know, once you arrive, what we're doing and what we're doing in training to prepare them for that arrival. But I think it's very important to the fire chiefs listening to the hump they hang out and those that have some influence that it's making sure that we're front loading the incident correctly. I, I kind of piggyback on, on that uh, a little bit, Steve. You know, the, I think the response thing is crucial. I mean, for example, we we send an extra ladder on commercial fires, uh, one on a house and two two on a 
on a commercial, but even that, you know, isn't, isn't a lot enough. You know, I don't have control over our dispatch center and there's some issue, you know, I'll stop there. Um, but, uh, you know, one thing I have done to, 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 you know, in our treat in our chief's training is I basically train our chief officers that um, if you, you respond to an average house fire, it's a working fire, you get what we call as a working fire dispatch. So you get an extra engine, the, our rehab unit, and the shift commander. If you if you get a if you've got any significant fire in a commercial building, and I'm not talking about the 10 by 10 taco truck, but I mean you know you get a, a any significant fire in a commercial building, that's pretty much an automatic second alarm. Uh, and that just pretty much that, that's just a, a quick way for us since I can't control what dispatch does. That's a quick knee jerk reaction that we can program our people to, um, you know, to react to that to get that resource package uh, in route. And if you, and the old adage, if you don't need them, you send them home. But it's it's much better to have things that you don't need than to want things you don't have. Um, the other kind of wrench I'll kind of throw in it though, because we run a lot of it here, is we have a lot of structures particularly you know that were that were houses that have been converted into commercial we had a fire uh, a couple weeks ago in one of those and um you, you pull up and it happened to be a nighttime fire and a thick smoke covering the thing you know we didn't know we thought it was a house for at least the first 10 minutes you know what i mean and then you get in and you realize that it's a converted structure and even though that it, it doesn't have necessarily the size of the walmart it did have a lot of commercial building challenges, um, you know, uh, window bars uh, of all different types, you know, the layout, the layout issues, the fire loading and stuff like that. So, I mean, I'll just throw that out while I'm thinking about it is, is you know, sometimes these places aren't just going to have a big sign on the outside that says, I'm a commercial building full of hazards. You know, sometimes you're going to have to kind of, you're going to have to discover what that is along the way. And one of the lessons we learned from that was that, you know, the, the original response package that was configured for that call, it was dispatched as a house fire. So it got a house fire response. And when we determined it was a commercial structure, we should have updated that with our through our dispatch center and, and requested the balance of the response, which would have gotten the additional ladder because that would have been helpful in, in mitigating some of the problems that we found there. I mean, what we find up here in the Northeast is this, this everybody around us is so manpower limited that we have no choice but to send from our department to send what we send on everything. You know, that, that outhouse, that mobile home, that, that four bedroom colonial and that Walmart are all getting the same response because not everybody's willing to share right away on an initial alarm because they get burned out because the Walmart is always an on, is, is, is the automatic alarm for the Walmart is always a false alarm. So we tend to not load the first the automatic alarm necessarily, unless it's followed up by a, by a telephone alarm. And then, like you said, Nick, you go into a second alarm quick just to get the out of town help coming. So, so Ricky, uh, uh, and, and, and we got a great question came in on uh, uh, FE talk. Does that mean that you're only sending the same amount of BCs and such like the, and, and, and the uh, Billy asked me to ask everybody uh, how many BCs, or how many chief officers, uh, or command level officers, are you sending to commercial fires, or is it just the same as a residential? Kind of following up with what Ricky was just saying here about you know their response. Um, if you guys could elaborate on that, that was a question we got off FE Talk. But um, fascinating stuff, and, and, it, and it reminds me of that. And I'm trying to think of the the, the tower, the name of the tower. Um, oh man, where the guy, you know, they they went and they went and they went and they went, and then bingo. You know, eventually that false alarm is down and dirty, and it's the real deal. Oh, it's inevitably. I mean, it, it, it's for us. It depends. It, it is time of the day dependent. It is who's on shift dependent. Once if if I'm working, I'm acting as the company officer. So you're getting myself on the fire truck as the company officer as a chief, but you're also getting the fire chief coming in in the car during the day at night. We're at nine o'clock, we go down to strictly paid call coming from home. So you may have myself and the chief responding separately, as well as company level officers responding on the apparatus. You know, at work, um, you have a captain in the car who essentially acts as the battalion. And for the most part, you're not getting the chief until it's a second alarm fire. You'll get out of town chiefs coming with their companies, though. So most of the time. Uh, and that's, 
that's an issue that that uh, we have a big problem with in our in our entire region. If uh, if that fire came in, you know, we border Hamilton Township. We border the city of Trenton. If Trenton were to get that commercial fire, they're they're going to send a battalion on the initial, and then they're going to get a second battalion more than likely. You know, when they upgrade that it's a working fire or whatever the case may be. Um, in our township, where we don't have assigned battalions as of yet, although they keep saying with consolidation, we'll see it. Uh, and I keep holding on to see that. But in reality, we really don't know. So to answer uh, Bill's question is, we don't know. We know that we will have a chief assigned, but we don't have additional chiefs assigned unless they mark up with mutual aid departments coming to us. So that is a serious problem. And, and I, and I, to go at that from a command point of it, you know, so you have an incident commander in, in all reality, all these calls in my first due, the captain on the first due piece is going to run that job until a chief shows up. And that could be 10, 15, you never know how many minutes into the job. So we're already hamstrung because where are you running your command from? You know, if, if you ran your command from inside the vestibule in the building and the fire was in a different portion of it, could you could you have command and control of your crew and the fire? You know, there's so many what ifs depending on on the larger building, the smaller building, the, the Taco Bell, the the, um, you know, the 7-Eleven, that sort of thing. I think we can handle it from a command standpoint a little easier, uh, even if we only have the three engines, two trucks and a and a battalion chief, at least we have a little better grip on the command because it's a smaller incident. Uh, but the minute we go to the big box store, we go to the warehouse, uh, the four story ho wooden hotel, those sorts of things. I think that's where it really changes on that command structure. And, and again, I'm speaking as a company officer, not as a chief officer. We, uh, uh, just to give another side, we're, we're fortunate enough. We have five on duty battalions and a shift commander. Um, all first alarm assignments get a uh, get two chief officers and the shift commander responds on the work and fire dispatch um, or at their discretion as soon as he thinks it's a fire. Um, on a second alarm, we would get an additional chief. Um, and then we have, you know, we have staff like myself that have take home cars and will respond also to stuff. So I would say, I mean, at minimum for us on a commercial fire, we're getting three. More than likely, we're getting at least four. Um, and you know, to just on to kind of tie that, you know, to how we use them, we believe in and, and have found very, very good success with strong division control, meaning strong division supervisors, which means putting chiefs in gear in an air pack and sending them towards the action area and letting them manage the tactical level of that incident. So the first of our, our first chief officer, of course, transfer command from the company officer and be the IC. Our second chief officer will dress out and get assigned usually to the the area uh, of either most concern or most action. Uh, and then the third, the shift commander will come and he will be the, uh, the aide or the senior advisor to the incident commander. And then the fourth, you know, additional chief officers would begin to be assigned um, to divisions as, as, as applicable. And, and I had that kind of in my notes as one of the, <clears throat> one of the differences between residential structures and this just from the command perspective, um, you know, on a residential structure, we're typically dividing our incidents by floor, division one, division two, things like that. Whereas on a commercial structure, we typically shift towards by, by access point or by side. So division alpha, division Bravo, division Charlie, depending on where the, the companies are, are entering and operating. And I, I think that especially when you get to the commercial occupancy and when you get to the, the tragedies that we've seen in commercial occupancies, um, one of the uh, one of the most important things you can do is make sure that you have that strong tactical level supervision. I'm not talking about a chief, you know, breathing air next to the nozzleman, but you know, he's probably might be on air a little bit back in the smoke, being able to control what the conditions look like. Is you know the movement of crews as their air gets low and somebody else comes in to replace them, you know, all that kind of stuff and. And that's not something we usually try to saddle our company officer with because our company officer already has a, super, a supervisory job and that's to supervise his crew. When I can send an extra chief there uh, and that guy is, for lack of better terms, a free agent, you know, he didn't come with any other ducklings to watch, that's the perfect person to put in charge of multiple companies that are operating either in the same area or doing the same task. But I hope Chief Pegram speaks up about this because I've always thought that the system, the chief, the chief system there, 
that they operate in is very cool and a very innovative uh, egoless system that, that a lot of a lot of areas like that uh, could embrace. I'm sure he knows some of the areas to which I might be referring that aren't that way. <laughs> yeah. So so real quick, in our neck of the woods, we um, we do not have departments that have battalion chiefs or shift commanders on duty. The majority of the chief officers are staff chiefs, so it's chief of department, maybe an operations chief, maybe an EMS chief, a training chief, but most of them are 40-hour people, uh, but all with take-home vehicles. So each chief or each department has what we call an IMAT group or incident management assistance team. And each fire chief chooses um, who to uh, page, if you will, on a reported fire or any other type of incident that you want your IMAT team. So we actually have uh, our main headquarters station is station 18. So in the CAD system, there's actually a unit called IMAT 18. And we can build that unit into any type of response. Uh, for example, we have it on all structure fires. We have it on a plane crash. We have it on a train incident, the hazmat, things like that. When the dispatcher dispatches that, I'm at 18, just like engines and ladders and quints and such, it sends a alphanumeric page to all those chief officers' phones. So we're paging about eight to 10 chiefs, basically all my border chiefs and some of my border uh, deputy chiefs. Now, the, the, the way the system works is they're not scheduled, there's no guarantee. So all eight could respond. And like we've sort of talked about, you know, if the fire's on Tuesday at 10 a.m., uh, everybody's at work, you're probably going to get a real good response. You're going to get four to six chief officers. Nights and weekends, the way we operate is all those chief officers are on call. So they're coming from home and other activities, but we'll still average a good three to five. Um, what's kind of unique about it is me as the chief in Goshen, I'm on all these neighboring departments, incident management response teams. So I may be dispatched to a fire in a neighboring community that no one else from my department is responding to, uh, but I'm going as a chief officer. Um, so it, it increases the opportunity for me to go to more incidents, which is cool and probably why Nick likes it. And, um, but it also gives me more experience. It gives me more opportunity to fill those command roles, whether it be safety officer or an interior position like Nick talked about, uh, side alpha, side Charlie, assist, jump in the car and assist with accountability and running the radios and things like that. So it's, it's a cool way to operate because it's very inexpensive. Um, we're not paying battalion chiefs to be on shift, although some departments are moving in that direction as they get bigger and busier. Um, but all the chiefs kind of back each other up and we keep in touch with each other because we know we operate that way. If one of us is going on vacation or going out of town for a couple of days or won't be available, we just send a group text to the group and let everybody know. So we always know who's in town, who's out of town and make sure that we have coverage. And all of our employees know that it doesn't matter if it's chief 18 or chief 40 or chief 26, if they get there first, they've got command. And we all use the same incident command system. We have the same incident command policy, the same accountability policy, even though we're independent fire departments. So uh, it works pretty well for us. And again, it's inexpensive. And it, uh, from a chief officer standpoint, it's nice to get out of the office once in a while and get dirty. Uh, and we assign those roles very similar to Nick spoke about. First arriving is command. And then almost always um, my deputy chief, it, if we're both rolling out of the house or the firehouse at the same time, um, it's kind of an unwritten rule that I'm going to take command and he's going to throw his air pack and gear on and find out where the fire is and how we're progressing and give me a can report. And that's, and then we assign additional officers from there. We're at the halfway point of our hour. So real quick, I just wanted to give a shout out to the Honeywell scholarship. Honeywell, uh, once again, is doing a scholarship to FDIC 2018. Uh, it's a full ride for the week. So um, we're looking for you to nominate a firefighter that you think is deserving and would really benefit from the experience of going to FDIC for the week. They'll be able to participate in all the classes, all the activities, the events. And there's even some special events scheduled just for the scholarship participants. So if you know a firefighter that would really love the opportunity to go to F FDIC, maybe they can't afford to go or the department can't afford to send them, you can go to FDIC.com and get all the information to nominate somebody for the Honeywell Scholarship for 2018. Um, so we appreciate Honeywell partnering with Penwell once again to offer that scholarship. But we really need people to put in for that um, so that all those spots get filled and everybody gets that opportunity. 
Aaron, let me kick it back to you and we'll continue the conversation on commercial building fires. All right. Well, thanks. I, I think so far we're making some, we're making a lot of people think, and I know just some of the stuff that's going back and forth has made me think, and there's probably a couple clips of this that um, I'm going to play from, for our commissioners and maybe they'll even listen. I don't know, but uh, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be terrible. Um, I, I guess one of the things that, that we need to discuss, and we talked about the, the training aspect of it is the simple tactical skills required, you know, how do we get our people comfortable with running two and a half inch lines? How do we get them comfortable with, as Nick talked about earlier, doing flat roof work? If, if, if their department's even going to do flat roof work, uh, some departments will not go to a, a flat roof if they think that it's, uh, you know, if they, if they think it's a steel roof. Um, so there again, they've got to, there's got to be a mechanism in place to get them training on each of these tactics. Large area search is probably one of the most misunderstood and, and least trained on tactics that's really required in, in, this type of, in this type of fire. And granted, these tactics can be adjusted, again, from the McDonald's all the way up to the Walmart. Um, one of the discussions that we've had was just simply recognition of what you're going to. You know the address in your first due. What what should be going through that first due company officer's head? What should be going through the nozzleman's head? Little little drills like that at the kitchen table can be a great start to it. Um, if they've already got a decent set of SOPs or SOGs in place or or procedures on arrival, let's base those conversations on our procedures that we're going to have on the 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 fact that. In this department, we've only got three people riding the rig, whereas opposed to in this department, we've got five or six. Um, I was always amazed at departments around here in Jersey that wrote their SOPs based on the FDNY, which is great, except that we aren't them and we don't roll out 100 guys on a 1075, you know. But we got cool SOPs. So we have to make it fit what we do. Um, what I do in Hamilton is probably not going to fit what, Steve Pegram does in Goshen or, or the, what Nick has in his place. So um, those are big deals. Those are really big deals. Understanding that we're going to use different tools. Our forcible entry is going to be more complex by far. You know, forcible entry into that, that mobile home that we talked about earlier versus forcible entry into the jewelry store in the middle of the strip mall or, you know, even the back of a Kohl's department store is certainly not the same. So we've got to address these in training before they pull up at three in the morning and go, oh, crap, now what? You know? Um, so that's that's one of the big things that we're pushing at. Um, guys want to jump in, Russ? Well, in terms of entry and exit issues, I mean, who does your inspections? That's simple training. That's training that doesn't cost you anything because the guys are on duty anyway. Who's doing your inspections? Do the keys work? Are the keys in the lockbox? Are your lock boxes located around the back if the building's big enough? You know, what better way to force a door than to use the key? What better way to control a door than with an intact door? And if you know, you know, you see all these real cool internet video bo videos about how you're going to defeat these locks. Well, it's a pretty easy way to defeat them, and that's with the, you know, the key out of the lock box. And if you know, if, you, if your guys are the ones that are out there doing your inspections, and if your fire prevention guys are passing it along, then it makes the, it makes it, infinitely simpler at three in the morning when there's smoke puffing out. You know, and you don't, you don't necessarily have, there's no mystery to what you're going into. Just a thought. Uh, I can tell you in, in, in the big box store <clears throat> class that I've been doing at FDIC for quite a while, one of the criticisms I got of the class in, in last year's uh, critiques of it was, well, you, you talked an awful lot about fire prevention and inspections. And I thought, well, yeah, because it's kind of important that we that we do these things, and we un that's where I learn about buildings, you know, the the company walkthrough or the fire marshal gives me some information on it and puts it into our into our in house system. Um, so, yeah, and and it's not just when I'm in uniform, you know, when you go to the grocery store and you're walking through, do your own pre planning, you know, and and it's we go to pick up lunch every day. I can tell you the inside of that shop right like there's no tomorrow. Uh, what my forcible entry problems are, how long my stretches are just by how long a walk we take to get to the deli cabinet. 
So these are the things that if it becomes second nature, uh, you know, it'll it'll really click again when when things are going wrong. I just think it all falls back to how you train your mind. And, and you know, we talk about muscle memory and so many other things. And we fall back to that when it's hitting the fan. Guarantee watching some of those videos from what happened in Vegas the other night and looking at some of the, the military guys who were making grabs over and over again. They fell back to their training. It was just second nature. They weren't thinking deeply on we have to take step one, step two, step three, and step four. It was because it's been ingrained in them. Our job is no different. It just needs to get ingrained from our training officers, our company officers, and into our firefighters that we treat these buildings and these responses differently than we do, you know, the residentials. You know, to dovetail briefly with what Aaron just said, my kid said the first thing that went through his head was avoid the bottlenecks, right? That's what they teach them in, in Sears school, avoid the bottlenecks. So one of the things when we're talking about these commercial buildings and, and you know, hardening the openings and the exits, which is critical. Also, where are your connections? Where are your sprinkler connections? Where are your, you know, where, where are your, where are your standpipes? And remember, especially on some of these uh, smaller, lightweight uh, commercial ones, not even lightweight, but just standalones, oftentimes they'll guise those things. They'll, they'll blend them into the actual building paint scheme or whatever. So, you know, the, the, the red top looks like the red of the building it, because they're worried more about aesthetics than accessibility. So, you know, when Aaron said, you know, that, that the folks, the guys and gals on the inspection tours were having a problem, that, that's where you pick up these invaluable pieces of information. You know, just like when you walk into any building, you know, if, where are my exits? Where would I go in case, you know, when you check into a hotel, where, where, where are the stairwells? Where's the, you know, how would I, how would I get in or out of this place? That's, that's the first thing that should be going through your head and getting out into these uh, uh, commercial occupancies is just critical because they are different than our residential occupancies and loads can change. And, and when you look at the, you know, take a fast food place, you, you got these carts of highly combustible plastics that are on freaking wheels you know, dumpsters and trash bins that can block your exits, block your entrances. You got to be ready for all that kind of stuff. You got to be ready for these incredibly unusual fuel loads, these dynamic fires. And, and uh, although, you know, uh, if it comes in at three o'clock in the morning, you're not going to go in there and save the Hamburglar. But, you know, if it comes in at any other time, you can have a well-meaning uh, civilian or employee go in with a, you know, two ABC to try to put out a fire, you know, that, that that's just not the appropriate tool for, right? And so, you know, we've got a, a plethora of, of commercial issues, you know, uh, below, you know, the below grade issues that come into it. You've got the elevators that are out in the street in some communities. You know, you've got just a, just a wide variety of things that, that we don't see on our residential fires, right? And so these commercial fires, they're a playground we don't get to play in enough because people care about commercial property. They take better care of them in a lot of, in a lot of regards. The, the protection systems are a little more robust. But when they fail and when we go, these are dynamically complex fires that we have to, you know, take a deep breath, pay attention and, and pull out of our bag of knowledge and skills and abilities every, every tool we ever, ever heard. So whether it's the fuel loading, whether it's the water supply, whether it's the access egress, um, you know, elevator shafts in there. Remember elevator shafts inside of a residential or an R3 or a, you know, uh, type building are generally enclosed and fireproofed and, and all that other good stuff. You can have open elevator shafts in commercial buildings. Uh, you, you can have stairwells that go to fuel loading, you know, take Hackensack. I know it's an old example, but, you know, all the storage, the incredible weight that was up above those uh, firefighters, unsuspecting firefighters, we should understand and identify that stuff early. You know, Southwest supermarket, you know, you, get, you have the drop ceiling inside the uh, occupied area or the, or the shopping area, but no drop ceiling back in the storage area, right? So there's your fire spread angle, uh, the Walgreens fires, the, the, you know, the outside in fires, you know, these commercial fires oftentimes comes in as a dumpster fire or a fire adjacent or a car fire, a fire in a carport. Next thing you know, it's up in the cock loft, it's up into the attic area. And those are fires over your heads. Anytime the fire's over your head or under your feet, that's a big day. And you, you gotta be playing all those scenarios out in your head. You gotta be, you know, I love the the comment by how many chiefs are you sending? Even if you can get other chief officers on the radio, more fingers on the knife 
to kind of lift a little bit of that um, tension and, and complexity off of that first arriving or off of that initial BC so that they have support, right? There's nothing like having people to support you in your decision making uh, to help you make better decisions. The, the error of the Lone Ranger incident commander is dead, Tonto. <laughs> I think Bobby, I think we would all agree um, that commercial fires kind of fall into that low frequency, high risk type of event. Uh, and if you look at the that model that Gordon Graham talks about, um, the events that you don't go to very often but have a high degree of risk, uh, both to the occupants but also to your firefighters, need to be trained on. And I think that's what the, the overall – uh, mission or, or lesson, I think, that we're going to talk about here is the repetition and the drill. You know, even though Goshen, Ohio, you know, it's highly probable we will not go to a fire this year that we have to pull a two and a half on. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't practice on a regular basis pulling, stretching, dragging, maneuvering the two and a half because the, the, that skill set has to be learned and that skill set has to be repeated or, or we lose it. We lose that talent. Um, you know, it, it's the old analogy, you know, you can ride a bike and get back on it 10 years later. Yeah, but you're not going to ride it as cool as you did when you were 12, when you were riding it every day to and from school and to the firehouse and chasing fire apparatus and stuff like that. I can't do all the things I did on a bicycle back then that I can do now. But it's that repetition. And, and we've been dealing with that locally here a little bit of getting the two and a half off the truck and getting your hands on it. And um, yeah, you can manhandle it and you can be strong and you can wrestle with it and, and try to beat it up that way. But if you learn some techniques and you, and you go to a conference, for example, FDIC would be a great example, and learn some techniques on ways to handle those hose lines and how to brace and how to move the line and how to move the line when you're flowing and stuff like that, those are, are things that you can train your folks on, that you can repeat, that you can do. So that if and when you got to pull that two and a half, people feel more comfortable. Because I think a lot of times people don't pull the two and a half even when they're supposed to because they're a little bit scared of it. And especially in a low manpower environment. But um, we've been trying very hard to get our people to pull that two and a half off the truck and drill with it um, just so they become more comfortable. And it's that repetition. You got to have the repetition, um, whether you're training people in instant command and doing sets and reps in a sim lab or pulling the hand line off the truck. Uh, it's sets and reps, sets and reps, and getting them comfortable uh, with a ground monitor, with the two and a half, with extending a hose line. I know someone made a comment on Twitter about extending the hose line. A lot of these commercial occupancies, we get into a situation where our hose loads that we normally carry aren't going to reach. Um, so how prepared, how much are your folks prepared to break down that line and extend the line? Uh, but I think all those points are really important. But at the end of the day, it's getting people out on the street and get the hands on the hose. I think it's, I think it's also important, you know, uh, we talk a lot about um, the different things that we're going to do. You know, hey, we're going to pull the two and a half at this fire. You know, guys, you know, especially in this generation, guys have to understand why we're doing that um, just as much as they have to understand what we're going to do. So, I mean, I try and explain to guys, hey, look, you're going to be either on a line or on a rope in this building because of the, the square footage, you know, in a house, there's a window or a door every few feet. You're not dealing with that in a commercial structure, you know, Hey, a commercial structure, we're probably going to be focused, uh, you know, in a residential structure, rather, we traditionally take the attack line straight through the front door because we're protecting egress, we're protecting the stairs. The, the hallway is generally the best way to all the places in the house, but at a commercial building, the best place to take the attack line is whatever entrance is closer to the closest to the fire. You know, businesses generally have areas that are designed for the public to access, and that's usually on the front. And then they have areas they don't want the public getting into. So with the front area, if you go in there, you encounter challenges with getting to the rear storeroom or with getting to the kitchen or getting to the production area or whatever that is. And I think that in a lot of training things, if people understand not only what you're telling them to do, but why you're telling them to do that and why that makes sense, it helps them embrace it more and it helps them fundamentally make a better decision, you know, on the fire ground at three in the morning. Absolutely. Rusty or uh, Aaron, uh, believe it or not, we're already at the top of the hour. Any uh, final words of wisdom or comments you'd like to get on record? 
I'll throw in quick. I just one of the things we've always done with New England Fools, <clears throat> excuse me, is we've always, anytime we've done any kind of engine work, we've always teached and preached two and a half work. And we questioned it for a little while. And then uh, one year, 10 days after a class that we did, and Aaron, I don't know if you remember this or not, I got a phone call from uh, a local captain that had taken the class, and he was all excited. They had had a fire and pulled a two and a half. And guess what? The fire went out. And they were able to do it with limited manpower. And, and they were all excited about it. And we just, this, Aaron said, this past weekend, we were up in York County, Maine, um, doing, a, doing a class for York County Chiefs. So we did an engine program. And we had two and a half. We were stretching it. We were flowing it. We were moving it through the building. We were moving it through the parking lot just to get people comfortable with one, two, three men moving it. Because that's what you're going to have for the companies. So, I mean, for us, in terms of the fools up here, that's one of the things we really like to pass along to everybody is that you can do it. It's easy to do it just as long as you're doing it correctly. You don't have to pull it off, put a loop in it, and sit on the front lawn. The two and a half is for more than that. You know? Yeah. Aaron. Well, yeah, I guess I guess my final thoughts are, are, are quite similar that um, you know, the more you do it, the more it just becomes easy. Uh for my department, we're no different than anybody else. We don't go to as many fires as, as some places do. We still see some work. Uh, on 4th of July, you know, in a very strange way, uh, there were three working jobs in Hamilton Township that were all going good, and we went mutual aid to another one. So four jobs within, you know, really a five-mile radius. Uh, three of those four jobs, the first new company pulled the two and a half and went to work. And the knockdown was proven the the effectiveness a uh, couple of them were really just very very large fires that there was not much we could do except deal with the exposure well how about if that was just just for an example and i use this in the classes too is the walmart is the prime example with the auto repair section in there you know they do the oil changes and tires what if the the, the exposure to that building is the fires in that auto repair facility and the rest of the building is the exposure it's an interior exposure. How hard would it be for a single engine company to get a two and a half between where those man doors are that are normally glass coming from the repair bays into the functional area of the store? If you can just do that, you may have bought enough time for civilians to get out of the building and maybe, I know this is God forbid, but maybe the second do or the second line puts the fire out but you just made the biggest save of your freaking career. So it's the little things like that, that if we can get our mindset that I do this at residentials, but I'm thinking this big picture at, at commercials, it might just make the difference. And, and that's why I, I got involved in teaching it. I saw a need for it throughout the, throughout our community and throughout the fire service community. And it's out there and it needs to be done. And uh, you know, listen, uh, since it's the final thought, come to FDIC, take some classes that some of the guys on this panel are teaching about it, read some articles that these guys are writing, and 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 bring it home, man, and then teach it to your guys. Because, you know, Nick Martin and Aaron Heller and Rusty Ricker and Steve Pegram and Chief Halton can't go to every firehouse and teach it. That's why it's taught at FDIC, so you can. And that's, that's you know, my goal for everything. So, uh awesome. It's, it's another great, great day, another great hour hanging out with you guys, um, and, and I really appreciate it. And just, I'm sorry I was late to the very beginning, but uh, my prayers are with everybody that dealt with everything in Las Vegas and, and what the country's going through. And don't forget everybody that just went through these storms, because they're only two or three weeks past, and now we've moved on to the next news story. And I got a good friend who's a retired uh, Trenton fireman who lives on Duck Key, and uh, miraculously, his house made it through perfectly yet almost all his neighbors are destroyed so it's it's a hell of a rebuilding process so uh, our prayers are certainly with them and that's my spiel for the day thank you awesome Aaron Bobby Halton anything uh, you want to say before we wrap up today no as always thank you to the instructor society hey if you're not a member please uh, go to the instructor society register now the, the benefits are amazing discounts to FDIC important networking. They just got done with a phenomenal conference. Uh, they do an annual conference that we're uh, proud to support. Unfortunately, I was 
moving my children, so I couldn't uh, participate this year, but I heard it was a resounding success, great instructors. And also, uh, if you're in the Delaware or Maryland area or D.C., uh, Jersey, <clears throat> American Fire Service lost a really important uh, member, uh, Lou Amabilly. Um, he's being uh, mourned. His uh, details are on Fire Engineering and Firefighter Nation. Um, please, uh, if you can, make the viewing. If you can, uh, make the event. Uh, Lou, Lou gave his entire life to the American Fire Service. He was one of the original guys on America Burning. He was a true gentleman, a mentor, a friend. Uh, he was a very kind soul. He was a, truly a, a decent man and um, deserving of our respect, admiration. And, and if you're in the area, please, please uh, make an effort to get by. If you're in Ashtabula, Ohio, I'll be in Ashtabula this Saturday uh, speaking, and I'd love to see you there. Um, beautiful place to visit, one of my favorite places. So. Uh, please, if you're close enough to pay respects to Lou's family, I know it would be greatly appreciated. On behalf of everybody here at Fire Engineering, um, our deepest uh, sympathies to Lou, to everyone affected by the hurricanes, the recent tragedy in Vegas, and uh, we keep going. We keep showing up. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming on the show again this month. Uh, a lot of great uh, nuggets, I think, throughout the hour. And uh, we'll be back with you uh, the first Wednesday of November, believe it or not already. We're talking about November. November 1st, 1 p.m., Hump Day Hangout, focused on training. Remember the Honeywell Scholarship to FDIC 2018. Applications are available at FDIC.com. Uh, George D. Post, Instructor of the Year Award. Uh, we really need those nominations in here soon so we can make that decision for the Instructor and of the Year. Dollar. Uh, yeah, the Courage and Valor Award also given out at FDIC. Uh, those applications are on Fire Engineering's website. Uh, we need those articles for fire rescue, especially training and instructor development uh, focused. And uh, that really brings us to the end of the show. We appreciate the opportunity with Penwell Fire Engineering. And uh, for the next month, stay safe and keep training. <laughs>